Everybody who knows Angie Yarnell is shocked to hear that she's left her husband and run off with another man. Just left, just vanished. But this postcard Angie's mother received saying her daughter and new love are visiting his family in her state would end up telling a very different and infinitely more sinister story. After a top forensic handwriting expert makes a chilling discovery that spells foul play. This was, it turns out to be, the central piece of evidence that blew this case wide open. It's kind of creepy if you think about it. Nobody may have ever uncovered the terrible truth about Angie if it hadn't been for her courageous and tenacious mom, Mary Ann, who was already fighting throat cancer when she suddenly found herself waging yet another battle to learn what really happened to her daughter. These are two tragedies that are stacked on each other. I tried to find help. I could not find a soul that could help me. Nobody seemed to know what to do. But Marianne believes it was her determination to get to the bottom of her daughter's case that actually helped her beat the throat cancer just so she could speak for her. I had to find my voice and I had to fight. I had to fight real hard to get the things done that, that I've gotten done. Angie was Marianne's only daughter, born and raised a simple country girl in the little town of Holt Summit, Missouri. Angie has always been a really unique person, funny little child. She was an artist. She loved poetry. And her pets, which had made her dream of a career working with animals. She loved her dogs. Her dogs were her children. Angie had also hoped to have children one day with her husband of three years, Michael Yarnell. She seemed real happy with him, at first anyway. But Marianne says the couple quickly began having problems in their marriage. Early on, she told me that he was emotionally and verbally abusive. But then they seemed to work it out. Until Michael accused Angie of being unfaithful. Did Angie ever have an affair? No. He said that she'd been having an affair, but it was he, in fact, that was having the affair uh, with a woman also named Angie. And Mary Ann says the marriage finally collapsed. But she never expressed anything other than toward the end, he said he was leaving her. But then, shocking news, when Michael turns up at Mary Ann's home one day to tell her that Angie has just left him. He said, well, She's gone now. And I said, what do you mean she's gone? He said, I think she must have ran away with another man. And I said, well, who'd she run away with? And he said, well, I don't know. I came home and she was gone. Marianne is dumbfounded. And you found that hard to believe? Very hard to believe. Why? Surely she would have let me know something about some guy, right? But she didn't. So for her to skip town and not convey any information to you, that was highly unusual. Highly. Especially as Angie, 28, had been helping care for her mother as she battled cancer. She certainly wouldn't have left me sick like that. And when she still hasn't heard from Angie by the following day, Mary Ann files a missing persons report. They didn't want to accept it at first. They said she probably did run away with another man. Marianne hopes police are right. I'm trying to fool myself because I don't want to admit that, that she's dead. In the weeks after Angie went missing, her mom would receive a very odd piece of mail that would play a huge role in the case. Ten days later, I received a postcard and it was postmarked from Harrison, Arkansas. It reads, Mom, we are going to Texas tomorrow to visit Gary's family. We'll write soon as we are settled. Love, Angie. And I thought, dang, she really did go with some guy and his name is Gary. Mary Ann was even looking forward to meeting Angie's new man at Thanksgiving in just a few weeks' time. She always knew how I was about holidays. Everybody needs to come here because it's a holiday and I mean it. I was certain she would be here and bring Gary. She would not miss Thanksgiving. But she'd miss this one. And as more weeks go by with no word from Angie, her increasingly despairing mother starts examining that postcard a little more closely. I could tell that it looked sort of like her writing, but not her normal writing. 
Now Marianne finally accepts the truth she tried so hard to not let herself believe. What leaped out to you at, that finally made you say, wow, this actually is a forgery? I could just tell. Even in the beginning, I said it's not her normal writing. There were a lot of dots where it was like written really slowly. And some of the letters, she's, I've never seen her write like that. The only clue to the whereabouts of Angie Arnell is a postcard her mother, Mary Ann, had received. Seeming to confirm the stunning news that Angie's husband, Michael, had broken to her a week earlier. That Angie had left him and run off with another man. And it says, Mom, Gary and I are on our way to visit his family in Texas. We'll call when we are settled. Love, Angie. Angie had never mentioned anyone named Garrett or her mother, and it was unlike her daughter to just up and leave their little hometown of Holt Summit, Missouri, without at least saying goodbye. Instantly, I knew something was very wrong. And when months go by with no more word from Angie, Mary Ann comes to believe the postcard was a forgery and turns detective trying to find her. I hung thousands of flyers. I drove to different states. I hang flyers, I put them on windshields, uh, in parking lots. I, I got billboards. I did everything I could with local TV. All this while battling throat cancer. I was physically really unhealthy. I mean, I lived on the verge of tears and it, it was just really hard. It's really hard to not know where, you're, where your person is, especially your child. But for several years, Marianne makes no headway in her search for Angie until her heartbreaking plight comes to the attention of a local newspaper reporter. It was sad to see that Marianne had done this enormous investigation on her own, so that's what really reeled it in for me. Reve Edwards would write a story about Angie's disappearance for the Jefferson City News Tribune that would attract broad media attention. And something very odd and dramatic suddenly happens. Four years after her daughter would go missing, Michael Yernell would be named a person of interest in the case. But before police could talk to him, Michael himself would disappear. I was told by his stepmother that he left town with his clothes tumbling in the dryer. Never to return to the home he once shared with Angie. I had no clue where he was. And Marianne, who had always suspected Angie's husband may have had something to do with her disappearance, is convinced the media spotlight on the case had driven him into hiding. I want to know where he is. Because now you're really suspicious of his activity regarding your daughter's case. Yes, he really, he, he was the enemy. Marianne and her new ally, Reve Edwards, figured the best chance of locating Garnell is to have police list him as a missing person. And Reve had also arranged for a professional handwriting expert to examine that strange postcard Marianne had received after Angie first disappeared. In these hooks seen in the bottom of the four, that hook is also seen in the H. Peggy Walla, who's worked on numerous criminal cases for police, would compare the postcard to other samples of Angie's handwriting, immediately noticing numerous differences. What jumped out at you when you were analyzing this postcard? The first thing that jumped out at me was the shape of the ends of the S's. It was also lacking a hook at the bottom of the first stem of the capital letter H. The N formation was different. The G the lowercase g formation was different. And she quickly come to an unquestionable conclusion. So when I got the postcard and the samples, I said she didn't write it. But that's not all Peggy Wallo would discover. After also comparing the writing on the postcard to that of Michael Yarnell on a handwritten statement he'd given to police at the time of Angie's disappearance. And bingo. I said, this is the hand that wrote the postcard. I wasn't at all surprised, not in the least bit surprised uh, at that point. What was your reaction when Peggy Walla came back and said, this postcard is a forgery and Mike Yarnell was the one who wrote it? Absolute excitement, because I knew that was going to be our key to get him charged with, it, with something. And from there, it snowballed. 
with that missing persons report that sleuths Marianne and Reve Edwards had filed on Michael Yarnell finally paying off. When he shows up in Biloxi, Mississippi. Mike Yarnell had tried, uh, had applied for a, a civilian job on an Air Force base there. And they did a background check and saw that he was listed as a missing person. Detaining him and alerting the Morgan County Sheriff's Office back in Missouri. They sent two detectives down to talk to him. Confronted with the results of that handwriting analysis by Peggy Walla, Yarnell would come clean about the postcard Marianne received a week after her daughter's disappearance. Mike admitted that he sent that postcard with the thought of throwing law investigation off and giving Marianne a little bit of peace. And after being extradited back to Missouri on felony charges of forgery and tampering with evidence, Yarnell would ultimately confess to killing his wife Angie during an argument at their home. He said that they had gotten into a fight and it spilled out onto the deck. And that she lunged toward him and that he put his arms up in an X motion in front of his face and shoved her. He said she fell off the deck and hit her head on a rock and died instantly. And he said he sat with her for a while. Then he wrapped her up in a tarp and he put her in the car. And drove to a nearby lake, put her body in a canoe, and rowed to a deserted little island. But when he was right at the shore of the island, the boat fell over and she sank into the mud and he couldn't get her out. So he just left her there and went home. As part of a plea deal Yarnell would make with prosecutors, he agreed to lead police to Angie's body. They followed him to the island where he claims he lost her body. Nothing was ever found. Which makes Marianne furious. Nonetheless, they decided to give him the plea bargain anyway. Prosecutors dropping murder and other charges against Yarnell in return for him pleading guilty to a much lesser charge of first degree involuntary manslaughter. He was handed seven years and he spent exactly four years in a minimum security prison. After getting early release for good behavior. Why would they agree to this plea deal? It seems ludicrous. It does. It was, it was sad to watch this man get by with killing his wife, mainly because he hid her body so well that they had no proof. But prosecutors had told Marianne that even with his confession, they doubted they could win a murder conviction against Yarnell. Even though he said he killed her, they had no evidence. And the evidence is literally her body. And now, 15 long years since Angie was killed, her still grieving mother continues to search for her, saying she suspects Yarnell lied about how she died and believes her daughter's body is buried somewhere on the property where the couple used to live. I've searched that property like you can't believe for so many years. I mean, I take a shovel and I go down there. I dig holes. This might be the place, you never know. I crawl under houses. I've been at the bottom of sinkholes. I've been in caves. I've sifted through big burn piles. I've looked in barrels. I do this. I, I look for Angie. Look at this. And Marianne, who ties a ribbon around a tree at her home every year Angie remains missing, swears she won't stop looking for her daughter's body until she finds it. I just need to bring her home. I won't quit. I won't quit looking. I will look for her. As long as I'm physically able, I go look for her. Sadly, even if Angie's body is found, double jeopardy laws would prevent Michael Yarnell from being tried again. We did ask the Morgan County prosecutor and the sheriff's department for on-camera interviews. They both declined. The prosecuting attorney did, however, send us this written statement saying, you're welcome to reach out to them, them being the sheriff's department, but my advice to them is that we cannot jeopardize other possible prosecutions by making public comment.